is that many of these exoplanets uh, that we know of are really in danger of being engulfed by their stars when their stars fall. Uh, so I'm going to explain to you how it is that stars uh, manage to engulf their planets. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the evidence that we can try to get from studying red giant stars to see whether or not we can find stars that we know eat their planets. Um, and then finally, um, I want to end on a slightly happier note and talk a little bit about the planets that uh, aren't quite due to that fate but actually have a chance of survival. Uh, we now know of many thousands of planets orbiting stars other than our sun. The field of exoplanets is still a relatively new field um, but it has really grown over the last 20 years of its existence. Um, but I'd like to point out that even though we are now finding so many um, exoplanetary systems and we're starting to see a large diversity in their characteristics, um, the galaxy is actually relatively unexplored. Uh, this uh, image that you're seeing up here is an artist's representation of our Milky Way galaxy, uh, with a little red spot showing where our solar system is. And then every little red point that you see on there is representing one of these known exoplanetary systems. And what I hope you realize is when you look at this, we have really only sampled a tiny little sliver of our Milky Way galaxy. So our galaxy can be teeming with many more um, planets of which we have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever. Um, I also want to point out really quickly, uh, this image on this and the next slide uh, comes from this excellent app called the Exoplanet app. I highly recommend it. Um, it allows you to kind of zoom around the galaxy to see where these exoplanetary systems are. Um, it is updated constantly with the um, latest and greatest new discoveries. Um, it also lets you explore uh, the systems themselves and see um, how big these planets are. If they're transiting planets, it'll tell you when the next transits are, um, and all sorts of very useful and fun information. Now, the exoplanets that we know about, um, we're pretty sure that you know stars all around us um, have uh, planets around them, but of the ones that we know, um, I would say probably close to half of them are actually concentrated in this one small patch of the sky. Um, so this is now just a different view uh, looking up towards the constellation Cygnus. And this is where the spacecraft Kepler um, spent the last couple of years staring at a single patch of sky, looking at over 100,000 stars, waiting for those stars to be dimmed slightly as the planet passed in orbit between the star and us viewing it. And by this method of discovery, um, we've been able to find many thousands of planetary candidates and confirmed uh, close to a thousand as well. Uh, but the crazy thing about this is that this method of finding planets, waiting for them to transit, actually requires a very special alignment. You can imagine if a planet is orbiting this way around its star, you'll have absolutely no chance of seeing it by transit. Um, so this is actually just, uh, again, another tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the planets that we can find. Um, but this uh, mission has been quite successful in teaching us a lot about the types of planets that exist. Let's talk about exoplanets. Um, they generally refer to them using uh, two key characteristics. Um, the first is the size of the planet, um, either in the mass or the radius. And which of this information is available actually depends on how the planet was discovered. Um, so just um, as a reminder of the planets in our own solar system, we have gas giant planets, we have ice giant planets, and we have uh, terrestrial planets. Um, and if you follow the news about exoplanets that are discovered, you'll frequently hear things like, you know, mini Neptunes and super Earths and Jupiters and Neptunes. And the reason why we do this is try to just give a, a reference point to re relatively how big or small these planets are with respect to the planets that we have in our solar system. Uh, the second key piece of information is the distance to the star. Um, and this has a couple of directly related characteristics. Um, the closer to the star you are, the uh, shorter your time to orbit. And the closer to the star, the hotter you are. Um, so you will frequently hear things like um, hot Jupiters or cold Jupiters, or you know a hot this or a cold that. And that is just to tell you relatively how close are you to the star, and are you warmer or cooler than this sort of similar sized planet in our solar system. Um, and one cool thing, um, if you see on this bottom plot here, um, this is showing the relative separation of Mercury and Venus in our solar system. Um, one of the really unusual things coming out of uh, these uh, discoveries is that we tend to find these really big planets really close to their star. Um, in this particular system, Kepler 11, um, there are six planets in the system, and there are five of them bigger than Mercury, all orbiting closer to their star than Mercury is in our own solar system. Now, so this is a very different type of architecture than what we see and what we are expecting to see when we uh, when looking for planets. Um, actually, one of, one of the good things with having planets this closely packed is that you can measure the gravitational interaction. Oh, which actually yeah. tells you that they're real and they're, that they're there. 
I'm just showing you the relative sizes and orbital distances of exoplanets compared to our solar system. Um, both of these plots, uh, so showing that first characteristic, the size of the planet on the y-axis and the distance um, on the bottom axis. And both of these axes are in logarithmic space, so every time you jump um, an even number of space, you're uh, multiplying by a factor of 10. So one of the things that you can see, um, I'll point out on this one over here, so we have our terrestrial planets uh, down here, we have our gas giants up here, um, and our ice giants here. And you can see, even after uh, 20 years of searching for planets, we're still not quite at the ability to detect our solar system. We're working on it, but not quite there yet. Um, so we're, we're starting to find things that are uh, quite similar to Jupiter, uh, but we're still you know, struggling to find planets down here. And the emptiness here is a detection limit. So it's not that these planets don't exist, it's that these are harder to find. Um, but what's really interesting um, and was completely unexpected is the number of these massive planets, uh, Jupiter-sized planets, that are orbiting very, very close to their stars. But although we have uh, many um, confirmed planets discovered by the Kepler satellite, um, there's actually many, many more uh, planet candidates. Um, so this one is showing um, the, so, the sort of two characteristics of so now the radius of the planet and the orbital period of the Kepler planet candidates. Now, the problem is that there are some um, other astrophysical phenomena that can look like the transit of a planet. Um, the Kepler team thinks that about 90% of these planet candidates are real. Uh, we just don't know which 90%. Um, now, there is something really interesting about this, though, um, which is that uh, so these lines are showing the size of Jupiter, the size of Neptune, and the size of Earth. Um, these Jupiter planets are the easiest to find. They have the largest signal. So the fact that we have much more of these is telling us that these sort of super-Earth and mini-Neptune things are actually a lot more common um, than Jupiter-sized planets at this distance. And we can maybe hope then that as we push our detection limits down, that Earth will be common as well. Current tally, um, just from Kepler alone, um, is a thousand confirmed exoplanets with uh, many more um, exoplanet candidates. Okay, now this all comes back then uh, to the life cycle of stars, which I wanted to touch on briefly. Um, so this diagram up here is just showing a pictorial representation of how stars evolve. Um, so essentially you start with this cloud of gas and dust, um, which collapses down into a ball. Um, getting hotter and hotter until you're capable of starting hydrogen fusion in the core. Uh, when that happens, the star stabilizes and you get something like our sun, um, which will happily burn hydrogen in its core uh, for many billions of years and not change very much in terms of its temperature, size, or brightness. However, that central core of hydrogen will eventually be used up, and when that happens, uh, the star will change drastically. In particular, what happens is that the star expands enormously over a relatively short amount of time and will eventually end its life by puffing off its atmosphere and leaving behind a dead stellar core uh, known as a white dwarf. I wanted to show um, two scale on this x-axis here, which is uh, currently the distance, how big a star gets. Um, so when the sun starts to expand, it'll go through a few stages, um, getting larger and larger and larger. Um, and so you can see from the edge, anything that is you know, in line with this edge of the star and to the left is going to be inside the future radius of the sun, um, which is quite problematic for these planets. Um, Earth's right here seems to be happy, hot, but happy. Um, of course, that you have to take into account. It turns out it's not just relevant um, how big the star gets. But you do have to take into account tidal forces. Um, so the idea behind this, um, which you might have some familiarity with, with our moon and the oceans on Earth, um, but the idea is that if you have two um, uh, bodies, a more massive one and a, small, a smaller body, um, and particularly in the case like a, a star or the ocean, which is a very fluid, um, made up of a very fluid material, if you put this smaller body close enough uh, to this larger one, it can induce tides on this larger body. Um, and this is simply due to the fact that the gravity um, felt um, by an object is stronger the closer you are um, to the other mass. So in this case, the side of, of if you think of this as a star and a planet, uh, this side of the star is closer to the planet than the far side of the star. And that difference, um, when the planet is close enough, that difference is enough to actually stretch out the star into a sort of football shape. And this is highly exaggerated, um, but just to get the point. Now, if both of these things were perfectly stationary, nothing interesting would happen. However, both the star is rotating and the planet is going around the star. 
And so you can have basically two different scenarios. In one case, this sort of, uh, it's known as the tidal bulge, uh, will lead um, the planet. Gravity is trying to pull this thing back into this alignment. So in this situation here, you've now introduced a torque that is going to try to realign the star with the planet. And in the case where this uh, bulge is leading, that torque is going to pull back and try to slow down the star. It will actually transfer angular momentum to the planet and push it outwards. And if that sounds familiar, um, it turns out that's what we're doing to the moon. Um, we're going faster than the moon is going around us, and that's why our um, tidal interaction is actually slowly pushing the moon outwards. However, if you have the opposite situation where uh, the star in this case is going slower, then that torque is going to try to spin the star up and try to get it uh, realigned with the planet. That will take angular momentum from the planet's orbit, which will pull the planet inwards. Um, which is actually an interesting situation, because once you pull that planet inwards, this tidal effect becomes much more pronounced, um, and the planet will have a shorter period, and so you can expect actually a rapid in-spiraling um, of the planet into the star. So it turns out you have to worry about that, um, and if you do the calculation for a Jupiter-sized planet, um, it means that you can expect Jupiters that are five times uh, the distance from the stellar surface to actually be pulled in by tidal force. Um, so that will extend the reach out to here, uh, which looks a lot less promising for Earth. Uh, however, um, I should point out that I did that calculation for a Jupiter-sized planet. Um, you would expect something the size of Earth to be um, have less effect um, on the tides since it's less massive. And so I get asked a lot what's going to happen to the Earth, um, and it turns out that that sort of critical separation of whether it goes in or if it's okay, um, we're currently at the kind of boundary where the uncertainties of exactly how those tides work and how you know, the sun is evolving, um, the uncertainties are big enough that we don't quite know the answer. Um, though I put a couple of uh, papers that I've read uh, relatively recently that seem to be working in favor of the Earth is doomed, um, but they might be wrong. Um, it'll be too hot anyway, so I think we're doomed no matter what. Um, but whether we go inside the star or not is as yet unknown. When you get a planet, um, so Mercury is at 88 days. So, but once you start getting into these um, really short period planets, they have something like, so once you're sort of in the, like if you push planets right now to five times the solar radius, where this would be relevant, their periods are going to be like two days. And so they would be in orbits that are actually going to work to pull them in. But although our planets right now, um, all of our planets are, have slower periods that our sun is rotating, when the sun becomes bigger, you expect its rotation to slow down. Um, and this is a simple uh, conservation of angular momentum. Um, the sort of best representation we usually give is the ice skater, which you, know, you make yourself smaller by pulling your arms in, you go fast. Over the same angular momentum, you make yourself bigger, you uh, slow down. So when the sun um, expands, it will have a much, much longer rotation period than its current 28-day period. One piece of evidence that you might find that a star has engulfed the planet is if it's rotating faster than you think it should be. Um, so in particular, red giant stars are both expected to be and generally observed to be very slow rotators. Um, but there is a small percentage of these red giant stars that are known to be fast rotators. And these are interesting because we think that they must have gotten spun up uh, by some means. Um, what about other ways of searching for planet engulfment? Um, if you follow the exoplanet news, you may have seen uh, this press release that came out a few years ago now uh, talking about evidence of a red giant star um, that had destroyed a planet. And this is a discovery, um, what this was is a discovery of a uh, Jupiter-sized planet orbiting a red giant star. Um, but, that, but there were two interesting properties of the system. Uh, one was that they noted that the orbit of the planet was surprisingly elliptical. Um, just given the position of this orbit, they would have expected the orbit to have become circular, but it wasn't. And generally, if you have a case like that, you need some other massive body to perturb that orbit into a non-circular orbit. So they hypothesized that there must either be or have been a massive, another planet in that uh, system to cause the, the planet that they saw to have such an oval-shaped orbit. Lithium in red giant stars is a very interesting problem that has a long and fascinating history, which is why I study it. Um, so lithium is an, is an interesting element um, because it's not made um, very easily um, in the universe, and there are lots of easy ways to destroy it. 
Um, in particular, once it gets above about 2 million degrees or so, it has a tendency to run into protons, fuse, and become something else. Um, and 2 million degrees is hot, but when you're talking about stellar interiors, it's not really that hot at all. And so most stars, um, they start off with some amount of lithium when they're born, um, but the vast majority of the star is so hot that that lithium gets burned up um, and fuses and becomes other things. And it's really only in the outermost layer of the star um, where, we can, where we can see it, um, where lithium is preserved. Now, when a star becomes a red giant star, one of the things that it does is it grows very big. But the other thing that happens is that its surface uh, layer actually becomes convective. Uh, so you want to imagine um, basically boiling water, except, you know, putting <coughs> plasma on a star. Um, and what's important about this is that it's actually the outer about 80% of the mass of the star that is now getting completely mixed up. And so that little bit of lithium that you kept um, safe during the earlier evolution now gets mixed and diluted to the star, in, into the star. So when you observe this red giant star, you expect to see very small amounts of lithium at the surface because it got mixed down into the interior, and so you can't see it anymore. So if you see high lithium in a star, um, it's possible evidence that you engulfed a planet, the reason being that cool objects like planets, um, they managed to keep all of the lithium they started with. Okay, so how do you find lithium, or how do you measure rotation in a star? Uh, so the way you do that is by using the star spectrum. Um, and so this is just an illustration of what a stellar spectrum looks like. Um, so you take its light, you break it up into the rainbow, um, but you'll see that uh, you get uh, these darker regions at very different, uh, very specific colors in the spectrum. And this is due to cool atoms and molecules in the star um, basically absorbing some lights at very specific colors um, as the light is trying to leave the star. And molecules and atoms have very specific colors that they like to absorb light at. So you can actually use the array of lines in the star to identify um, which atoms and molecules are present and in what abundance. Um, so this is uh, now showing if you can take, imagine taking a slice across the spectrum and measuring brightness um, as a function of the color, um, you would expect to see something like this, where these little um, deep regions here are these uh, uh, absorption lines. So the way you measure rotation um, is actually kind of ingenious. If you guys are familiar with uh, the Doppler effect, uh, this is a sort of relative shift in um, frequency of a moving object. So sirens, for example, sound higher pitched when they're driving towards you and lower pitched when they're driving away from you. Um, with light, you get a blue shift or a red shift of the light. Um, now when you observe a star, you're observing um, the, the entire surface all at once. However, you can imagine um, that what, what that is is the sum of a spectrum coming from every single point on the star, but some of those spectra are slightly blue shifted and some of those are slightly red shifted. If you have a star that's rotating very quickly, you have a sort of more exaggerated blue shift and red shift. And so when you add them all up, you get a broader line um, in a star that's rotating fast compared to a star that's rotating slowly. And so in this uh, case, uh, these are three samples of spectra taken um, at the very uh, same wavelength re uh, region. And so you can see as you go to faster rotators, these lines get broader and broader. And so this is the way that we actually measure rotation. And so if you, if you notice that that was the difference in the last one, that weird star is actually also a slightly faster rotator, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so one thing that you can then do is try to see if there are differences between the lithium abundance of stars and how fast they're rotating. Uh, so this is a plot showing that, uh, where you have the rotational velocity uh, measured in kilometers per second. Um, and this is a common measurement uh, way of uh, showing lithium abundance. Uh, you just want to think of this as it's a logarithmic um, scale again. So every time you jump uh, by one unit, you're going by a factor of 10 in the abundance of lithium. Um, the different colored points, um, these black points are slow rotators, these diamonds are fast rotators, um, and these orange points are slow rotators, but red giants that we know have planets around them, because, hey, there might have been something that came. Um, and one of the kind of interesting things that fell out of this, um, so that crazy high lithium rich star this guy sitting up here, um, is that you'll notice that the sort of lithium rich guys all tend to be um, fast rotators, but not all. We have some normal looking lithium here. Um, but if you kind of do just work in averages, you find um, that the fast, fast rotating stars tend to have more lithium than slow rotating stars. And if you convert this into eaten planets, you find that it corresponds on average <laughs> to about two or three Jupiters per solar mass of material. Um, 
But one thing that might be bothering you um, is the fact that you have all of these stars here that are sort of very spread out. And the question is, are all of these stars, is this normal? Should, can stars have like this huge range of lithium abundance? Remember, this is factors of 10 here. So there's over a thou factor of 1,000 difference between the most lithium-rich guy here and the guys at the bottom. Um, so some of this is probably um, because the stars are of different masses. Um, red giants are really annoying in that it's hard to know exactly how old or how massive they are if they're just sort of sitting by themselves. And we think that mass should play a role in this, um, which is kind of problematic um, if you think about it. Because then the question is, is, if you're looking at a star, how do you know if its lithium is normal or not? Um, so as an example, here is a red giant star, um, and we can uh, pretend to pull the red giants from, let's say, this middle region here, and give them uh, three different starting abundances of lithium, and run through the calculation of how much lithium would they have after they ate some planets. Um, so if you had one planet, um, you notice it makes the biggest difference in the star with the least amount of lithium. Um, but as you start packing planets in here, um, it starts to become irrelevant um, how much lithium you started with, because what you're measuring is basically um, the, the lithium that came from the planet. Uh, but you might notice the problem then is that if you observe a star um, that has this lithium abundance, whether or not that a planet has been engulfed um, kind of depends on where the star started with. But since you don't have the measurement of what the star started with, you don't know whether or not this is a star for which that lithium abundance is normal, or if you should have expected the star to have started here, in which case it's telling you that it, you know, it had some lunch, it, had, it ate a few planets. Um, so that's really a, a big problem um, in terms of trying to really find stars where we know um, the eight planets. Um, so I think one way to get around this is to try to study red giants in open clusters. Um, so you, you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with open clusters, um, but I want to point out this uh, cluster here is NGC 6819. Um, this is a fun cluster because it's in that Kepler field, so we actually know a lot about the stars in that cluster. Um, and if you plot stars that are in a cluster on a color magnitude diagram, um, you get something that looks like this. This is magnitudes here, which is why our brightness is going from uh, dim at large numbers and uh, bright at uh, lower numbers. Um, and this is actually a, a color temperature measured on the bottom, so you have cool blue stars here, and you go to um, hot, yeah, I said that backwards, uh, hot blue stars on this side and cool red stars on this side. And if you take the stars that are in the cluster, they tend to lie along a sequence. Um, and this is because these stars all started um, their lifetimes at the same time, and so these stars are all the same age. And so what the sequence is is actually a mass sequence. Um, stars that are here are still in the main sequence, they're like the sun, and if I extended this plot, they would go all the way down here, and you would have low mass stars here and get progressively more massive. Um, and same thing with the uh, red giant branch, uh, these stars are slightly uh, less massive, and they'll be red giants very shortly. And as you get to more massive stars, they're now red giants, and then the more massive stars have already gone through the red giant phase until they're no longer on this plot. Um, and so what's really cool about this is we now have a sample of red giants that are all the same mass all the same composition, and presumably should have all the same lithium. And in this particular cluster, there turns out to be one red giant that's lithium rich compared to the rest of these guys which have very low lithium. So this is a really interesting star, um, which again, I can give an entire talk on this. Um, there's a lot of weird things going on with this star. It appears to be slightly uh, rotating slightly rapidly, um, and really trying to figure out whether or not uh, the star ate a planet. Part of the problem is that its lithium is so high, it starts to become unfeasible to explain it with a planet. Um, I forget exactly what the, I think I came up with it, it had to be um, something like 100 Jupiter masses to explain the lithium, which is starting to become a little bit questionable, just because we don't find 100 Jupiter mass objects or being close to stars. Um, red giants and planets. Um, we now know of the myriad of exoplanets here, there's exoplanet systems that there are um, in the galaxy. Um, the ones with big planets close to their stars are easy to find, and so we found many of them. And what these planets are telling us is that they are going to be eaten when their stars evolve and become red giant stars. And from that, we can assume that some of those stars that are currently red giants probably ate their planets as well. Um, and I'm really interested in trying to find those. 
We have a number of red giants that show the signatures that you would expect, um, but some of them show signatures that we don't quite expect, such as having too much lithium. Um, and so we're trying to figure out whether or not there are other processes going on that we don't quite understand. Um, so there, we have yet to find a red giant where we can conclusively say, this star ate a planet. Is it all gloom and doom for exoplanets? Um, and the answer, um, as you might expect, is no, because um, it really depends on how far away you are from your star. Uh, so I talked earlier about these tidal forces. Um, so you can imagine, really, that if you're uh, far enough away from the star, um, you're going to be relatively safe. We already talked about for the Earth, we know if you're farther than the Earth and Earth size, you're probably safe, although we don't know if Earth itself is. Um, and there are a lot of factors um, that are um, working together to really figure out whether or not uh, the planet will go into the star or not. Um, so you have the tidal forces that are pulling us in, um, so that was one, one of these forces I talked about. Um, but one that I didn't talk about and also comes into the will Earth uh, survive or not um, is the fact that red giants also lose mass over time. Um, and the reason for this is as they're growing bigger, um, they're starting to get a less firm grasp on their atmosphere. Um, and so they will eventually blow off their atmosphere. And once you blow off the mass from the star, there's actually uh, less uh, gravity holding the planets in their orbits, and so the planet's orbits will expand as mass is lost from the system. Um, a much more cooler system is the dead uh, planet cores orbiting a dead stellar core. Um, so this is another discovery of planets around a B subdwarf. So this is another core of a former red giant. Um, but these planets are um, have half the mass of the Earth and are orbiting um, with orbital periods of just a few hours. So these things are super close. Uh, so this is picture C is the current configuration, the one that we observe. Um, so we know these planets had to be inside the star during the red giant phase. And we don't think that Earth-sized planets would have any chance of surviving that deep in the star that long and come out unscathed. So we think that they must have once been the cores of uh, Jupiter planets, Jupiter-sized planets, um, that went into the star during the red giant phase. Um, they had their atmosphere stripped, they helped strip the atmosphere of the star, and what you're left behind with is some dead planet cores around the dead stellar core. And if you, if you have planets that are far enough away, away from the star to leave the star alone and basically let it hold on to its atmosphere for as long as it was meant to, um, you end up um, with a similar um, but slightly different um, evolution where the star will lose its atmosphere naturally, um, and this actually gives us the sort of planetary nebula phase, uh, which I have the green nebula up here um, just for fun, because you guys can look at this if you want to. Um, and so what you're seeing here, uh, all of this colorful material, this is the envelope of a former red giant star. Um, it's glowing because of um, ionizing radiation coming from the core of the star that's right down here in the middle. Um, this will stick around, uh, we think, for about, um, I think it's ten, tens of thousands of years before fading away, uh, leaving behind just the white dwarf star. Um, white dwarfs are really awesome objects. Um, they are super, super dense. Um, they tend to be about the size of the Earth, but have about a half solar mass of material crammed into, uh, crammed into that size. Um, I forget what the ratio is, but you know, something like a teaspoon of a white dwarf is something like all the cars on the planet, you know, into a teaspoon if you want to try to wrap your head around that. Uh, but uh, these things, um, you know, once they're there, they're pretty much done. And although they start off very hot um, at tens or even hundreds of thousands of degrees, um, all they will do is sit in space and cool off and get colder and colder over time forever. Um, so that if you have any planets around this star that managed to survive the evolution, um, first of all, they've moved even farther away when the star shed its mass, um, and then they'll be orbiting on this sort of dead core that even though it starts off hot, um, will eventually cool off. And so the sort of other fate of planets that can manage to avoid the fiery fate um, is to eventually end up with a cold, freezing death around a dying star that will eventually just go out completely. Most of the exoplanets that we know of um, are really doomed to a fiery fate. Um, but as we continue to find more and more exoplanets, we'll eventually be able to find these faraway guys who will have a quite different fate um, and that will be very, very, very cool. Thanks.